Welcome to the Poor Man's Gourmet Kitchen, where we share gourmet recipes at a low-budget wonder. Now check this out. Here are the ingredients we'll be using for our maripois. Garlic, bell pepper, celery, and onion. Add the maripois to a pan with some melted butter. Stir in all the chopped vegetables thoroughly before you start to add your ingredients. The first thing we're going to add is Creole seasoning. This will be our main seasoning ingredient for our Cajun Etouffee. I like to add some actual Cajun seasoning. Just a pinch of that will do the trick. Once again, we're stirring it in and incorporating all the seasoning with the maripois. This will infuse all the flavors you're looking for for your etouffee. Now, we're going to be adding a roux, which is just melted butter and flour. Stir this in as well. Get it fully incorporated to infuse your flavors and let it sit. Now we'll be adding a stock and I'll be using clam juice. I'm going to pour in this entire bottle, which is about 8 ounces, 1 cup's worth. Shrimp stock can be used as well, but this is what I prefer. As you can see, it's thickening almost immediately. Just a few stirs and we've almost got a paste. This is a good sign because now it's time to add some more liquid. And now we're going to add a couple cups worth of chicken bouillon or chicken stock. This will help the bulk of our etouffee. Stir this in completely, bring to a boil, and start adding some Worcestershire. This is going to help the flavor tremendously. Just don't add too much or you're going to ruin it. And I like this sriracha for some kick. It's good to use some Louisiana hot sauce. But this is my favorite and I can add in such a small amount and it can go so far with kick. Trust me with the sriracha. And as you can see we've got it fully incorporated. It's a good time to taste it and see how our flavor is doing. I'm going to add a little bit of cream. Now, traditionally this doesn't go in there, but I'm making a lighter etouffee and the cream is going to help it a lot. But again I taste it because the cream tends to dull the flavor, but I think it's just right. So at this point, we're going to move over to our main ingredient, the crawfish. But we're going to season the crawfish before we add it, and I'm seasoning it with some of the Creole seasoning. Mix that thoroughly and make sure it's completely incorporated. Back to the stove, we're going to add some bay leaves and let those soak in as it boils. And now we'll add our crawfish. Got about a pound's worth here that's going in. And because we add that seasoning, it's going to flavor the entire etouffee. But just for kicks, I'm going to add just a pinch more. And some Worcestershire. Tasting this the entire way you're making it is key to the success of your etouffee. And sprinkle in some Italian seasoning, which normally isn't in the recipe. But I like it for the thyme, majorum, rosemary, sage, and basil effect. Now we'll just reduce it to a simmer and get ready to plate. Just like that. Right over the top, dead center of a nice pile of rice. And there you have it. Crawfish etouffee right here in the poor man's gourmet kitchen. Just so you know, I like to add some scallions on the top before I serve. 
<laughs> Thank you for watching and be sure to stop by poormansgourmetkitchen.com for more recipes and exact ingredients. First thing you're going to need is some chopped garlic. Also, a few slices of some fresh ginger, and you want to chop this up as well. Now here I've got some cleaned, boneless chicken thigh meat, and you can use boneless breasts if you prefer. But what you want to do is flip these over on their backsides, cut them lengthwise, and then you're going to flip them over the other direction and cut some bite-sized pieces. Something like this should be perfect. Now here in a bowl I've got one egg. I'm going to add some canola oil, a little bit of salt and pepper, and then I'm going to add a little bit of cornstarch here. And you want to just do this a little bit at a time. Give it a good stir and add it as you need it. And the consistency you're looking for is some runny like pudding. Now all you want to do is just pour this right over the top of all those cut pieces of chicken. And the best way to handle this is to just get in there with your hand, make sure it's mixed thoroughly, then cover it up with some saran wrap so you can marinate it for a little while. Then when you're ready, throw down some canola oil in a hot skillet. Make sure you get it spread out across the whole bottom there. And then drop that marinated chicken right in it. And this will take several minutes, but you want to just make sure that you cook it thoroughly until it looks something like this. Then I like to just make a little well here in the center and drop that garlic and ginger right in the middle so that heat can release its flavor. Then I stir it around in there and give it a good toss to make sure it's spread evenly. Then I drop in some soy sauce, some apple cider vinegar, some brown sugar, give that a good toss, and then some ketchup. Then once you get all four of those ingredients mixed in there real good, it's good to give it a little bit more toss, let it breathe a little bit. Then you want to add some apple juice, followed by some chicken broth. And to spice it up a bit, we're going to drop in some chili flakes. Now it's up to you whether or not you want to wait around at this point and let it reduce. If not, you can speed things up by adding a little bit of cornstarch. This is just diluted with a little bit of water to ensure there's no lumps. Then if you want you can shake in a little bit of bourbon or do what I'm doing and shake in some southern comfort. But rumor has it that this recipe doesn't even really have bourbon in it. So that's up to you. But once you get to about this consistency here, you're ready to serve. Just throw down some rice and spoon this right over the top. And there you have it, bourbon chicken, right here in the poor man's gourmet kitchen. Thank you for watching, and be sure to stop by poormansgourmetkitchen.com for more recipes and exact ingredients. First thing you want to do is start cutting your andouille sausage into bite-sized pieces. Then you want to start cooking that in a large pot with some olive oil over medium heat. Just drop the sausages right there in the bottom and start to brown. Meanwhile, you're going to need half of an onion. You can chop this into shallots. Then you want to chop some mild peppers. I'm using lunchbox peppers but you can use bell pepper or whatever you prefer. The important thing is that you get these into some julienne slices. And of course we're going to chop some garlic. Now as you can see, 
we get some good color on this andouille sausage. This is a good time to add those shallots and all that chopped pepper. And once you've got everything stirred in, just throw the lid on it and let it soften up a little bit. Now another important ingredient is the rice. And this really affects the flavor if you don't clean it. Make sure you give it a good rinse two to three times. Make sure you get all that chalky and stale taste out of it. It'll make all the difference in the world if you do it this way. Now back to the pot we want to add a few ingredients like that chopped garlic and we're going to add, believe it or not, some anchovy paste. Really going to help with the flavor as well. Now you need a stock in there but I like to pour some clam juice in there before I add the uh, chicken broth. This helps the flavor also. Give that a good stir and make sure those flavors are mixed in there. Then you add the rice. Okay, that's a secret here to really good jambalaya. Now once you flatten it out across the top here, you can start judging how much chicken broth you're going to be adding here. And I always touch with my finger here to the top of that rice and go to the first knuckle. Okay, it's just kind of a chef trick. You pour in the broth right here. then we're going to come back and measure with our finger. If I could touch that rice with the tip of my finger and the top of that water goes to that first knuckle then we've got enough liquid. Then you just add the lid, bring it to a boil and simmer for 20 minutes. Now I don't know about you but I gotta have shrimp in my jambalaya. And as you can see here for all my shrimp critics they are deveined. All we gotta do is peel them now. So as we take a look here, you can see the rice is cooked. It's not dried out and it's not soaky, sloppy, wet. It's real nice and moist. It's just right, just the way you want it. So the next step here is we're going to add some diced tomatoes here. And we're going to add some tomato sauce. And a little of my secret ingredient, some Worcestershire and some Louisiana hot sauce. And you can put in as much as you want, that's up to you. But last but not least, we're going to have this Creole seasoning. And again, it's going to be up to you how, how much kick you want, how much spice. But realize that makes it salty too, so you got to go easy with it at the same time. But once you've stirred it all in there, it's good to jump in with a spoon and give it a taste and see if it's to your liking. For me, I need a little bit more Creole seasoning. Just a little bit more bite. And once again we're stirring. But this is a good time to add that shrimp. You want to stir that in deep so everything's covered and can get affected by the heat. And we're going to throw the lid on that go another 10 minutes. as you can see, the shrimp is orange, pinkish, so they're cooked. And we've got a little liquid here, it's risen to the top, but all that flavor, all that tomato and all that spice is now cooked in there. And we just want to stir that all back down in there and make sure our rice stays moist. We do not want a dried out jambalaya. We also don't want to run it either for that matter. Just stir it in good and get ready to plate. Now pay attention there, as you can see it's not dried out and sticky, and it's not sloppy wet either. There's no runoff on the plate. No liquid, no juice on the bottom. It's just exactly the way your jambalaya should look. And there you have it. Jambalaya, right here in the Poor Man's Gourmet Kitchen. Thank you for watching and be sure to stop by poormansgourmetkitchen.com for more recipes and exact ingredients. Here I've got a dozen west coast oysters on ice. And as you can see here, they're very green, dark, and mossy on both sides of the shell. 
so we want to give these a good scrub and rinse with cold water. Now it's real important that we clean right inside here on the hinge where we shuck the oyster. That will ensure that we don't push any grime into the oyster when they're opened. And as you can see here, the scrubbing and cleaning makes a big difference on presentation. Now the oyster has two different sides, the flat side and the curved side. And you want to place the curved side down first when we're shucking. And all you do is fold a towel in half around the oyster and with a firm grip you can stick the shuck knife in the hinge and work it back and forth until it pops right open. Now just continue working the blade around the shell till it's open and with the flat edge of the knife cut the abductor muscle from the top of the shell. So you can see it pops right open and you can just slice whatever's left. And then cut the abductor muscle on the bottom and then roll the oyster over for presentation. Then when they're all finished you can lay them down into some rock salt to keep them from moving or drop them in a cupcake pan like I've done here. Now to make these Rockefeller we're going to drop in a couple cloves of garlic into a food processor. Also some green onion, a little bit of parsley, and then I'm going to stuff this full with baby spinach. And this is going to need a little liquid to emulsify so I'm going to drop in a little bit of white wine. And you can use ice water if you prefer. But just get this completely ground up until it turns into a nice paste. Then in a hot pan you want to melt some butter. Then add all of our ground veggies right to it. We're going to need to season this up a little bit so I'm going to add a little bit of crawfish boil seasoning with a little bit of smoked paprika, hit it with some Worcestershire, and a little balsamic vinegar. Then you want to just mix this in thoroughly over medium heat. Once all the ingredients are well combined you want to bring it to a light boil. Then I'm going to help thicken it up with a little bit of fresh grated Parmesan cheese. But you can also use breadcrumbs if you'd like. I usually kill the heat at this point and just stir the cheese in and just slowly watch it thicken up on its own. And when I can pull my spoon through the sauce like this, I usually just go ahead and set it aside and let it cool down a bit. And when you're ready, you can just spoon it over the top of each one of these half shell oysters. And if you're interested in more Cajun recipes, be sure to hang out to the end of this video. Now you want to take this to the broiler and have it set about three inches above the oysters on high for five minutes. Then pull them out and you want to go ahead and hit each one of them with just a little more Parmesan cheese. And again, you can use breadcrumbs too if you prefer. But once they're covered, you're going to go back in the broiler once again for just a couple minutes. Then hit them with a little fresh chopped parsley when they're done. And there you have it. Oysters Rockefeller right here in the poor man's gourmet kitchen. Thank you for watching and be sure to stop by poormansgourmetkitchen.com for more recipes and exact ingredients. Here I've got a five pound bag of frozen crawfish. It runs about four dollars a pound this way, but when you don't have access to live crawfish, this is a good alternative. The directions will often instruct you to keep them in the bag while they thaw, but I like to place them in a large bowl and separate all of the loose pieces. Because the crawfish are pre-cooked and shipped frozen, very often the claws and the legs will break off during the process. And it's not a bad idea to sort through here and get them all separated. As you can see, there's quite a bit. And as I place the crawfish in one bowl, the claws and legs will sift down to the bottom of the other. As you can see, there's a tremendous size difference between some of the crawfish. 
the larger crawfish claws are worth saving. And it'll be up to you which pieces you decide to keep, if any, or all for that matter. Just realize that there's plenty of meat that you can be getting out of these claws. And even though you've got all the tail meat to pull from all of these crawfish after they're cooked, it would sure be a shame to not take advantage of all the claw meat you could be getting out of all these pieces as well. The next thing you want to do is run some cold water right over the top of the crawfish and fill up the entire bowl so they can start thawing. But remember these are like little ice cubes and it's not sanitary to not leave some running water into the bowl while they thaw. Not only does this keep you free from bacteria, but it tends to thaw the crawfish much quicker this way. In the meantime you want to start preparing your boil. I've got some hot water here cooking in the bottom of this large pot. And over medium heat I'm going to start adding my ingredients, starting with this crawfish boil seasoning. And this can tend to be too spicy for some people, so I cut it with some tomato bouillon. That way we get the heat and the flavor. And it's always a good idea to add an onion as well. Sometimes I'll even add some crushed ginger but you're definitely going to need a stick of butter. And even though this seasoning's pretty instant, it's a good idea to let that butter melt down and that onion soften up during the duration of that crawfish thawing. And that could be upwards of a good hour or so. Just be sure to taste it first to make sure it's to your liking. And if it's done right, it's not going to be soft and soup-like. It's going to be bold and spicy. Without that strong flavor, your crawfish are going to be bland. So be sure that it's as salty as seawater. By now the crawfish should be thaw, and you can just run all the water out of the bowl, pour it straight down the sink, then take them back over to the stove and pour them right into the seasoned boil. Now if you're cooking live crawfish, you can use the exact same recipe. The only difference is the amount of cooking time. For the frozen crawfish, all we're looking to do is reheat and reconstitute that flavor. But for live crawfish, you want to cook for about 15 minutes, then come back and kill the heat. For frozen, you're going to kill the heat as soon as you place them in the pot. Then there's the soak time, and this takes approximately another 15 to 20 minutes is all. But it's the most important step, because this is where they get all their flavor. And you can just strain them out into a bowl. Keep in mind though, most crawfish boils add corn, potatoes, and andouille sausage to the mix. So that's something you'll want to consider when you're preparing your crawfish boil. But don't think for one second you should throw that broth out. Get it strained and saved for other recipes. This is great in jambalaya for example, and it can be the base of many soups or even pasta sauces, so hang on to it. The crawfish, however, is really good with more of that crawfish boil seasoning sprinkled over the top after you pull them out of the pot. Some folks like to even toss it in garlic butter. But let me show you how to eat crawfish. All you have to do is twist the tail from the body and you can suck the head, drink all that broth juice, lots of flavor in there. Now just get a firm grip of that tail meat and the end of the tail shell and you should be able to just pull it straight out like this. Another way of doing it, just twisting it straight through again, but you can remove the first layer of that tail shell all the way around, it comes right off, and then you'll have more tail meat to grip and grab and pull out. Sometimes it's easier this way. Now all you gotta do is serve them up. But before I forget, and I did, the claw meat is just as easy to remove as well. Just grab a hold of the pincher, twist and pull that straight through. It doesn't always work this smoothly, but nine times out of ten, you'll get it. And there you have it, frozen crawfish boil right here in the Poor Man's Gourmet Kitchen. Thank you for watching and be sure to stop by poormansgourmetkitchen.com for more recipes and exact ingredients.